I guess being a good bird photographer is no different from being a good birder. You know, you've got to have patience. Whether you want to actually see the bird or take a photograph of it, the techniques are actually the same. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Birding Today podcast, where birders come together to discuss the joy of birding. I'm your host, Guillaume Durig. Our guest for this episode is a retired professor from Monash University, where he was a director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Microbial Genomics. He had a very successful research career, focusing on understanding how bacteria cause disease and on vaccine development. He has been a keen traveller and has lived and worked in Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands and Japan, and reckons he can get along in about 10 languages. Today's guest discovered the joy of birding through photography. He's been an enthusiastic amateur photographer since his teenage years, and that kindled his interest in birding about five years ago. Since then, he takes every opportunity to get out to photograph birds. Listeners, viewers, please welcome the fantastic Mr. Ben Adler. How are you doing, Ben? Good afternoon, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, excited to be recording this second episode with you. Thanks for coming on. Oh, absolute pleasure. It, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. I've got a good feeling about this one. It's going to be excellent. Um, so let's jump right in. I, I'm interested in how you discovered the joy of birding through photography. Why, why photography? Yeah, uh, thanks, Guillaume. Look, that's a good point. Um, it, it really goes back to, uh, well, Teenage years, I, I got a job as a delivery boy for a pharmacy when I was about 13 and um, saved up my money. I got paid one pound a week and saved up and bought a 35 millimeter film camera, as they were back then. That's, that's all that was available. Um, and uh, then uh, soon after that, saved up a bit more money and bought my first um, SLR which I still have, by the way. It was a Practica SLR, very primitive by today's standards. Um, and I just became very interested in all aspects of photography. Um, um, used to go and try and photograph sport events. Um, I was keen on motor racing. You probably don't know, but I actually drove racing cars for a couple of years back in the early 70s. Wow. And um, so it, 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 it came about through that. I... I earned my pocket money in the late 60s and early 70s by doing wedding photos. It was all black and white in those days, of course. And uh, so you could do your own processing and your own printing. And I always figured, you know, doing wedding photos was a better way of earning money than stacking shelves in a supermarket. Mm. Anyway, let's jump forward. About five years ago, um, we're down on Stewart Island, down in the south southern part of uh, New Zealand. My wife's a New Zealander, as you probably know. And um, we were with another couple who um, were also keen photographers but interested in birds. And so we spent four or five days down there on, on Stewart Island going around photographing birds. And I just got hooked. And I thought, how easy is this? Because all of, not all, but a lot of the birds are on the ground and they're so tame. And I thought, oh, there's nothing to it. You know, bird photography, oh, easy. Uh -huh. Yeah, famous, la <laughs> famous last words. Um, but anyway, that was five years ago. And since then, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's become a wonderful hobby that, that uh, both of us enjoy. Um, you know, what more do you want? You get outside, you get out in nature, you get exercise, you, um, you, you get fresh air, you, you see wonderful birds, you take pictures of some of them. That's right. What's not yeah. to like? What's not it, to like? It's absolutely great. And it's a, it's a hobby that, is, that encompasses lots of different things. And so when you when you on Stuart Island, do you, which, what, do you remember what was the first bird that you remember photographing and thinking, oh, wow, I'm hooked on this now? W was there a specific bird? Yeah, that, ha, that's a good question. Um, a specific bird. Look, there were probably... A couple. So we went over um, onto, there's a small island called Alna or Alva, Alva Island, which is about five minutes by boat from Stewart Island. And it's a reserve. It's one of those places which is predator free. So New Zealand Department of Conservation has a very good track record 
um, of um, of eradicating introduced uh, pests, you know, rats, um, stoats in particular, ferrets, etc. Fortunately, we don't have those in Australia. And Oliver Island is like that. And we're walking through the bush, and suddenly this damn wecker <laughs> comes <laughs> comes out of the bush. And I'm saying. Stop, stop, don't, don't scare it away. Don't scare it away. You know, out with the camera, out with the camera. The damn thing came up and started picking me on the foot. <laughs> no, really? Wow. It was so tame. And then we got to the beach and there was a bird in the water. And you know, I said, wow, look, it's a, it's a big bird. I didn't know what it was. So I took a picture of it. Um, it turns out it was actually a shy albatross. Um, that was just kind of, you know, hanging out in one of the inlets there. So first first two birds would have been on that trip, probably a wecker and a shy albatross. Wow. Not that's, a bad start. That's not a bad start at all, yeah. And I suppose you still have those photos somewhere in, on your on your computer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sa safeguarding them for future generations, eh? That's that, that's <laughs> that, that's Well, yeah, let's let's hope they let's hope they're interested. We'll tell time. That's all right. And so that was five years ago. And yeah. times, have, times, have, times have changed now, and especially in the last two years. Has, has COVID-19 changed the way that you go about taking photos of birds, or is it basically the same, the same kind of thing? Oh, look, I think, I think COVID's, the pandemic's changed it for everybody. Um, I mean, part of the, I mentioned before, the, the joys of, of birding are that you... It's something that you can do with your partner. You get outside. I mentioned all that before. But the other thing is, of course, um, that, that it's, it's travel, is the travel component. And um, both uh, within Victoria, um, in other, to other parts of Australia, and, and also internationally. And, of course, COVID has put a complete stop to that. So really for the last two years, um, we've really been restricted to Victoria um, and as you well know, uh, for a good part of that time, we've been restricted to within five or ten or fifteen kilometres of home. Um, and so, has that changed? Does that change the way you take pictures? Or it's a difficult question to, to, to ask because, of course, you know the act of taking pictures doesn't change. But has your mentality or your attitude changed at all? Or oh, look, probably not. Perhaps, perhaps you appreciate the common birds a little bit more um i mean we were lucky in the in between lockdowns we managed to get a couple of trips up to the mallee um which is always wonderful i mean it's just you know my favorite victorian birding spot and did also actually on anzac day this year managed to get out on a pelagic trip oh wow off port ferry so and that, that, of course, was, was magic. Um, we were booked for another one, which got cancelled because of COVID. Um, but when you're restricted to home, often, um, you know, I found I'll get out with the camera and may not take any photographs at all. Still see lots of birds, but you say, okay, well, yeah, that's really great. Um, or you just take photographs because they might be better than the previous ones. We were down at Brayside about three or four days ago. Um, and there was a pair of blue-billed ducks that were just uh, doing their thing, diving and circling around each other. And um, so, you know, of course, you take photographs. They're a very photogenic bird. Um, and there were, you know, black swans with cygnets and um, coots with chicks, etc. cetera. Um, but if you mean technically in terms of taking photographs, probably not, probably mm. not. Mm. Yeah, there's 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 a change in some things, but not in other things. When it comes to you know the restrictions and not being able to do to, to go certain places, and so um, going around to take pictures of birds sounds easy, doesn't it? But <laughs> but what, what what makes a good bird photographer? What what makes a good bird photographer in terms of you know, whatever you can think of, technicality, attitude, what do you think? Oh, look, I think um, there are so many wonderful bird photographers out there. I mean, there, there are professional bird photographers. Um, there are amateur bird photographers. There's, um, you know, you're familiar with some of the uh, Facebook birding groups, but there are also Facebook 
bird photography groups. Mm. Um, just locally, BirdLife Australia has a – the Melbourne branch of BirdLife Australia has a photography subgroup that gets out together um, – once a month, although once again that's been curtailed because of COVID, gets out together once a month, um, really to photograph birds. Um, what makes a good bird? I guess if what you're asking is what do you need, I think you need patience. But that, I mean, look, I guess being a good bird photographer is no different from being a good birder. You know, you, you've got to have patience. Whether you want to actually see the bird or take a photograph of it, the techniques are actually the same. You know, you really still need to, to make an effort to understand the bird's behaviour, um, to try and get an understanding of the habitat, look at the habitat and say, well, this is where I'll find such and such. Um, you know, I remember earlier, yeah, I think it was earlier this year, being down at Anglesey with another birder that who you know very well. <laughs> um, and we were specifically looking for, for chestnut rumped heath wren. Um, and we were driving along the track and there was this area that you know, I'm not familiar with the bird, but this other person said, that's just the sort of area where we might find them. And we did. And I've got what I think are wonderful photographs of, of chestnut rumped um, heath wren. Wow. So I think, you know, I think you need patience. I think, the environment. Do we want to talk a bit about gear, or is that sort of too technical? Is that something we don't want to talk about? Oh, you could, you could, you could briefly mention what you've got. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, not specifically what I've got, but I guess it really comes down to almost asking the question: What if you want to start out? What do you need? The old story. Um, a wonderful wildlife photographer, Steve Perry from the US, and he didn't coin it, but he says this. He, he emphasizes this all the time it's the 84 rule 80 percent of a top of 80 percent of a photograph comes from four inches behind the viewfinder in other words the photographer <laughs> um, and another way of saying that is of course it's the photographer that takes the picture not the camera having said that you know i, I when i'm out you know, people come along and they say, oh, my iPhone will take photographs just that are just as good as yours. Well, I'm sorry, they're not. <laughs> um, you know, un unless a bird sits perfectly still two metres away from you, you won't get as good a photograph with a phone camera. Right. Um, if you did, all the professional photographers would use phone cameras and they don't. Having said that, you know, you don't need to, you know, the professional photographers will go, you know, and spend ten thousand dollars on a on a body, on a camera body, and another twenty five thousand dollars on a say a six hundred millimeter f four lens. You don't need that. My first camera was a Panasonic Bridge camera, it cost three hundred dollars. Mm. Took great photos. It was limited, and I've, I've moved on quite a bit from then. But it still took very, very good, very reasonable photographs. So you know, you don't need to spend a fortune. To, uh, to take good photos. Um, but I think there's, there's a kind of basic that, that you need. And I think you really need, in my opinion, at least a 400 millimeter lens or thereabouts. And you can pick those up for not too much money. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and th that makes sense. And I want to loop back on something you said that, that, that yep. you know, that perked my interest. You said being a, a good bird photographer is, is the same thing as being a good birder. But is a birder the same as a bird photographer? What's, what's, the, <laughs> what's the difference? Would you say you're a birder or a bird photographer yes, first? Yes, ab absolutely, both. Right. Um, absolutely, both. And, you know, there are times when you can't take a photograph and you can still enjoy the experience. Um, I remember it must have been a couple of years ago before the lockdown, we were down at Port Ferry and, uh, as you know, um, at, at dusk, when it gets dark, the uh, short-tailed shearwaters come in in their absolute thousands. And that was before there was this drop. There's been a drop in the last year or so, um, although they seem to be back 
they seem to have bounced back a bit. But anyway, there was a drop. But at this stage, there was something like 20,000 of them nesting in this, in this little small area. By the time they're all coming in, it was just too dark to take a photograph. But the experience was a magical one because you've suddenly got literally thousands and thousands of these birds all coming back simultaneously, flying around and getting down into their burrows. So, um, yeah, you, you, it, it's both. Right, absolutely. Absolute, I... Absolutely both. I mean, I guess the, the pure birders might say, well, you've got to have your guidebook with you and identify the bird in the field, I'm happy to take a photograph and then if I don't know what the bird is, try and identify it from the photograph. And I think even purest birders, a lot of them that I know have come around to that way of thinking, you know, they say, well, okay, that's okay. Now I know it's not the kind of, you know, classical way that things were done in the past, but uh, yeah, I mean, why not? Absolutely, yeah. And I, uh, I, I also, understand that point of view because I, I'm quite big into video. I like filming birds because I, I really think it captures a lot of the behavior and, uh, you know, a lot of details that, you know, that, that could be better expressed in video form, let's say. But I, I see you've what you... You've, Guillaume, you've, you've taken some great videos. I've seen them. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. That, that's very nice of you to say. But the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is, you know, the question of there being maybe a negative side to bird photography or bird videography and having a machine in between you and the bird, does it? do you think it disrupts the connection that you might be able to make without such a, such a, a device or not? Do you Look, see what I mean? It, do, it doesn't for me. Mm. It, it doesn't for me because, you know, you can, you can, uh, I've, not got into shooting video yet, although I, I probably should. That that's a bit more difficult. I mean, you 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 know, you need to set up more. I tend to do a lot of walking, and so all, almost all of my photos are handheld rather than using a tripod. Um, you know, because I tend to sort of wander through the bush, so so it's not not the ideal setup to take video. But you know, with stills, you take your photographs and then just watch. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so, the, so, you know, you're, 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 uh, <laughs> what you do is actually very similar. I mean, I've seen some of your photographs and they're great. So, you know, you, you, you can be both. That's, that's be exactly both. right. Yeah. But, but, you know, sometimes I just walk away from, from having seen, you know, a beautiful bird, you know, on a branch or whatever and walking away with some great footage on my SD card. And half of me wishing, oh, you know what? I wish I would have taken a bit longer to just look at it, look at it with binoculars and taken its beauty straight in, you know. But it's still, you know, that's this. This is just we're just kind of thinking out loud here, and that's what this podcast is about, you know. And 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 we could we could go on for hours, like I like I like yeah. I said in the last episode. But um, but so <laughs> so do you think is there a negative side to being a bird photographer at all, if any? Look, I think I think. It touches on what we've been discussing already. I think potentially there, there could be because you you can become a bit, and in my early days, I confess to being a little bit like that, you can become a bit obsessed about the photograph rather than the experience. Um, and I don't think I'm like that anymore. I mean, I think you, you, you can do both. So I think, yeah, there can be a negative aspect. The other... You know, the other thing is that I've seen out in the field some quite aggressive bird photographers. Um, you know, little. I'm, on one occasion, I'm being, and this is not an exaggeration, being almost physically shoved out of the way um, because you know I was here first. You, you, you go away, sort of thing. Um, and the second thing is, I think you. It's the same as being an ethical bird, and I think especially with photographs, you need to be aware of, of nesting birds, of, of breeding. I mean, there are some um, photography, bird photography, uh, like Facebook sites, that just don't allow photographs of nests mm. or, um, or, or, or nesting birds. Now, I don't go that far because it depends on your gear. I mean, if you're, if you're you know, 40 metres away from a nest without disturbing the birds, I don't see that as a problem. Um, 
or not necessarily. I mean, look, it depends on the birds. It depends on where the nest is. It depends on where you are, all those sorts of things. So I think there can be some negative aspects. On the other hand, the positive aspect is that you've got thousands of photographs that you go back and look at. And I confess that sometimes I'll hop into bed and instead of reading a book, I'll get my phone out. I've got something like 15,000 photographs on my phone and I'll just flip through. Oh, look, yeah, no, oh, this was some, um, yeah, this was the Mali two years ago. I'll just flip through and have a, just enjoy the photographs. Right. So I think the positives uh, outweigh the negatives. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of different aspects to it, isn't there, that, that are just so interesting. Sure. And, and so, what, so what was the most exciting f photographic experience that you've had with a bird? Oh, God, that's like saying, you know, what's your favourite food? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, right. <laughs> or, you know, what I think... Look, that... <laughs> It's hard to narrow down, but I'll, I'll, I can think of two examples. Um, and they're birding as well as bird photography. One was we spent well over an hour um, earlier this year on one of our trips up to the Mallee watching a pair of Mallee fowl work their mound. Uh, and they're, they're an amazing bird. I mean, they're, they're just absolutely amazing. And to just sit there for it was about an hour and 20 minutes and just watch this pair going around and and testing, you know, putting the bill in and saying, oh, it's too hot here, working the mound. Um, I thought that was, uh, look, it's a privilege. I, I viewed it as a privilege. It was just just magic. I actually did take some video on that occasion because it just the way they were behaving uh, lent itself beautifully to video. I guess the second one is, um, you know, watching a, uh, a wandering albatross slowly fly in and then land on the water, you know, three or four metres away. Um, also a magic experience. Um, and then, of course, you've got all the multicoloured parrots. I mean, in Australia, we have, you know, what is it, 58 species of parrots or something like that. So we're, we're very, very privileged. Uh, but, you know, you could go on and... You could name another three wonderful experiences. So Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. They're all great. Sure. They're all great. <laughs> That's right. And so you, 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 you said that you went up into the Mallee earlier this year. Is that is that type of habitat the you know the best place to photograph birds? What what's your favourite habitat? You know, because there's lots of different ways that you can photograph birds. You can be in a hide. You can be walking through the bush. You can be on a pelagic. You can just be in your garden. What's your favourite circumstance in which you like to have your camera on you and just shoot away? My favourite, look, yeah. Within Australia, yeah, I guess it, I guess it would be, or within Victoria, it would be the Mallee because I mean, the the environment is actually really conducive to, first of all, to seeing lots of birds, but but also to taking good photographs because it's fairly open. You know, you, you haven't got really – you haven't got trees that are 50 or 60 metres tall. I mean, you know, that, that's hard, you know, you're <laughs> photographing like that. Um, so I think, you know, the Mallee's um, – in Victoria, yeah, I would say the Mallee is, is the best spot. But, look, how, how can you compare that to a pelagic trip when you've got, uh, you know, all the petrels and albatross and storm petrels all sort of – you know, and, and gannets and stuff flying around. So, uh, yeah, but the, the Mallee's just kind of magic and, and the sheer variety of birds is, um, you know, make enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there's just, it's just so great, you know, and, and that's what we like, you know, that's what this podcast is all about, to discuss the joy of birding. And I... I'd like to say that I'd like to explore that on a, almost on a philosophical level. What is it that makes this activity so special? You know, I, it's, I, 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 can't put, I can't get my head around why it, it just speaks to us in that way. You know, when you see a bird and when you take a picture of a bird or you film a bird and you're happy with it or you just look at one through your binoculars or through your telescope, there's this joy that comes out and it just, I, I just don't know where it comes from. 
I mean, look, I've, I've heard people refer to it almost as a spiritual experience. Um, look, I mean, it, it's not just birds. I mean, if, if, you're, if you like nature and wildlife, look, one of the most amazing experiences of my entire life was on a game park in, in South Africa, galloping along on horseback for about, I would say, at least 100 to 150 metres with a giraffe loping along beside me for, for that 100 metres almost within touching, like two metres away. You could almost reach out and touch it. Incredible. Wow. What an experience. Yeah. What an experience that is. So, you know, it's not just birds, but, you know, I think in Australia um, for wildlife photography, birds, a lot of our wildlife here is nocturnal. So it makes photographing them much more difficult. Exactly right. Not impossible, more difficult. Um Whereas, you know, of course, we have nocturnal birds as well, but most of our birds are diurnal. So, so um, you know, it makes it easier. So I, th I think it's just a, if, you're, if you appreciate nature and, you know, as a scientist uh, and, and as a biological scientist, that's, it's always been something that's just wondrous. And, and it's part of us. I mean, we're, we're part of the ecosystem. And unfortunately, we're not doing a very good job of managing it. But that's another story. Exactly. Yeah, that's one for another for another episode, isn't it? But um, yeah. but so yeah, that's right. It's 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 really an interesting avenue of thought, isn't it? And there's there's just lots to talk about. So much to talk about. And and I agree with you that it's it's not just birds, but birds are the manifestation of what is possible. You know, because birds are so visible and they're everywhere that they're kind of the tip of the iceberg in some sense of that feeling of of wonder and beauty and joy. Because they're everywhere, and you can see them everywhere, and every day, and and yeah, I think it's I think it's wonderful, and it's I think spiritual is is a good way to describe the feeling that you get. It's it's difficult to find another good word for it, but yeah, it's it's and and, and the beauty of bird photography, to go back to bird photography, is that you can mm. capture that moment. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. And, yeah, absolutely, and. And yeah, that's that's. So I wanted to ask you: Do you have do you have a favourite bird? Oh God! <laughs> oh, look, impossible question to answer. I mean, I, you could name twenty. Um, you know, locally, I, I I really like gang gang cockatoos. I think they're they're um, they've just got some character. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean the the. Mally fowl for just watching them because because it's a I was going to say it's unique it's not quite unique there are there's some other species that incubate their eggs the same way but it's it's a rare way for uh, for birds to incubate their eggs uh, controlling the temperature of a mound of dirt and, and leaf litter right um, and yeah. and they and they're very handsome looking birds too um, and and look any of the parrots I mean you get up there and you see the Amazing mulga parrots and, uh, and regent parrots, um, uh, just magic. So, favorite bird? Yeah, probably parrots, I guess. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's, it's, like, it's like saying it's like saying it's like asking what's your favorite food. <laughs> yeah. Well, what is your favorite food? Anything. <laughs> well, Anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh well, it's 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 a difficult question. Yeah, I. I, I don't know what mine well, what's, is well, what's, well, Guillaume, what's, what's your favourite bird? Well, you know, there's always one that comes to mind and it ties in with the best experience, the, the most amazing birding experience I've ever had, or one of them at least, is when we were, we were in Borneo, my family and I, um, on the way to Australia from Europe in 2011. And my dad and I, um, so we were staying in this kind of rainforest hut sort of lodge, and my dad and I had taken a canoe with, you know, and we could row our way out up into the river and, and kind of have a, have a wander about. And it was, it was me and him in this canoe. And we were in the depths, you know, of the jungle on this quite wide river. And suddenly this, this amazing, dazzling, ruddy kingfisher flies along right next to us. You know, it crosses from one point of the river to the other millimeters i would say above the water and it was absolutely amazing you know blood red beak and just this this dirty rufous color 
you know, you couldn't have a, a, a more amazing experience than that. I, I it just subjectively speaking, I think that was one of the best experiences I've had. And that's probably my favorite bird because I've got this photographic snapshot of it, um, of that moment. And mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. of course, it's reinforced by the fact that I was with my father, which which kind of adds to the level of, you know, joy. So yeah, I, w I would say that 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 would be my favorite bird, okay. the ruddy kingfisher. I think yeah. So um, thanks, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> I think this, every every birder has a different answer to that. I think if, I think if you ask, you know, they have different ways of answering these questions. Like I could ask you, what's your is, is, is there a place that you that you dream of going to photograph birds? The, the, the dream destination that you'd want to go to? Um, actually, I think the answer to that is probably yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so uh, it's it's to my eternal regret. Now, I've, I've been to Colombia twice and Ecuador once was before I became interested in birds. And both those countries are just amazing in terms of biodiversity. I mean, I think Colombia has 1,700 or 1,800 species of bird. I think there's 180 species of hummingbird alone. Wow, you yeah. Know, because, of the, because of the geographical spread from coast and mangroves right through to, to, to high alpine regions. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been to those places. You know, I've, I've been through the mangroves. I've been through – and I didn't – I wasn't interested – birds at that stage so so those two countries probably like you know i'd like to go back to colombia um and ecuador um this time with the camera <laughs> right yeah 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 that they're amazing those places yeah i, I lived in chile for for a while these these past three mm. and a half years of I, I was in chile and that whole the whole south american continent is just amazing it's just Oh, we could, but th again, that's for another episode. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but let's so so let, we can start to wrap this up now. Um, so if there are any beginner bird photographers that are listening or watching, um, if you could give us top, you know, the top three tips from Ben Adler, what would they be for <laughs> to, for, for for bird photography? The top three. Maybe the top four or five. <laughs> look, I think, I think. Look, I think you need decent gear, not necessarily expensive gear, but if you want to take decent photographs, you, you'd need to do better than a phone camera. I think that's that's the first thing. Right. Um, you know, I, I routinely use a five hundred millimeter prime lens these days because it's better, slightly better than the zoom lenses you can get, but of course much more expensive. Um, just like being a birder, I think patience is absolutely essential. Um, one of the things that I like doing, and, and some of the bird photographers don't, both amateurs and professionals, you know, it's good to see some of the environment in the photograph. And you see a lot of photographs that have got this fantastic photograph of a bird that's pin sharp and shows all the features and everything and it's with a totally blank background, whether that's been um, pasted in or whether it's been deliberately done that way, that's fine. But I don't mind a bird photograph if there's a few twigs around and some flowers and leaves. So I think I, I don't mind, but I'd rather have the bird a little bit smaller in the frame and show some of its environment. But that's just personal choice. I mean, some people don't uh, don't like that. Um, I guess more advice, don't over-process. I see a lot of photographs that where people have got carried away with post-processing and the bird finishes up this brightly coloured thing that actually doesn't really look like the, the real thing. So I think, you know, you've got to be careful there. And I guess the last one, um, this is the last tip, meet other birders and other photographers. This is, this is the classic. Birders, in general, are fantastically friendly and, and helpful people. Um, we were a couple of years ago out at Werribee um, at the treatment plant, and um, sort of just a couple of young, this was wonderful, just a couple of young kids, are probably teenagers, on one of the tracks looking at something. So we very quietly went up and said, you know, what, what gives? There were two orange-bellied parrots in the in the salt bush there. Wow! 
Really? Um, yeah. And we we would have watched these, and they weren't going anywhere. They were feeding. They were. We probably watched them for an hour, um, and took lots of photographs. Most of which get deleted, of course, because you finish up deleting ninety percent of your photos. So I think you know meeting other birders um, is is something to be recommended. Uh, as I said, there's a Bird Life Australia special photography group that gets out. They're, they're amateurs. They're just guys, you know, people like me that just get out once a month and, you know, various mm -hmm. places around Melbourne, of course, don't go too far away. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, that was more than three. That was probably five. That's, <laughs> that's, that's perfect. And I think that's, that's it's really interesting to, to, to consider that birding is actually almost as much about people as, a, as, as it is about birds, you know. Because you just yeah, absolutely, mm. Guillaume. I dream destination because I just thought of something, and and it, we're actually doing it next year, and that's the sub Antarctic islands. Oh wow! Okay, that's that's fantastic. Okay, so that's that's to get down there to um, Macquarie, um, the Campbell Isle, Campbell um, Snares, Auckland Island, etc. Um, and so we have actually got a plan to do that in twenty twenty two. Wow, lovely! Because that, there'll be some species of bird that you that you can't see unless you do that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got to kind of embark on these specific kind of you know destinations to get what you want. You know, the uh, w any target birds. What what are you looking forward to seeing? Oh, well, Macquarie Island has four species of penguin, <laughs> which which probably wouldn't see anywhere. Ah, oh. okay. You might see them elsewhere, but but you'll see them for sure there. You know the the again two penguins, rock hopper penguins. Um, so uh, you know the penguins in particular, I think. Right. And then, yeah, then yeah. there are species of petrel there and uh, etc. and skewers, but you, you can't see those elsewhere. And and albatross, of course. So uh, looking forward to that in twenty twenty two. Fantastic. Yeah. God willing. Eh. Hopefully we'll we'll all be able to do that sort of stuff next year. Um, but I think that's a fantastic place to end. So. Ben, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. You've been terrific. And uh, I wish you all the best and happy birding. Likewise to you. Thank Ciao you so much. Bye-bye. See, See ya. You've been listening to the Birding Today podcast. New episodes are released every two weeks. And if you'd like to get in touch, just write to birdingtoday at gmail.com. See you next time. And thanks for listening.